last month I was talking about what made people cool and like why I think Miskiff fell off. Like why I think he's no longer cool. This is Miskiff right here. You look at this stuff he has in his streams. He's mad popular, dude. And he's like top dog streamer now. One of the one of the biggest ever. So it's crazy to see how far he's come. Like if I just like search up like I don't know if like a lot of the old stuff like I think these are two these two right here are good. I'm trying to show like when when he was like really coming up like rapidly. Look at like the charm to this. There's something about what is this? There's something about the the atmosphere in in these in these sorts of videos that are just lost. Very very basic editing, but just it just got the job done, you know. Like this whole vibe is so cozy and this just looks like this doesn't look like a group of streamers it looks like a group of friends who happen to be streaming and i i feel like there's two two totally different things this clip i've seen this clip a million times i don't know i don't think it actually now that is a great clip i think okay i think the way maya acted was really really inauthentic like when she acted like this like innocent like oh don't you embarrassing me all that stuff i think a lot of that stuff was just like baiting i don't think she was ever this like stupid ignorant like not not stupid like oblivious like she doesn't know how twitch works she doesn't know how any of this stuff works i think she always had an understanding as to like what she was doing the way she would farm even if she didn't know what emotes were she was still farming feelings emotions uh reactions from chat and i feel like she always knew that she was doing that and this like this like cute shy persona that she put on it feels really inauthentic like this Okay, like no that's complete bs nobody he's not even there like that's actual bs she's doing this because she's reading chat sorry, sorry, sorry. okay i'm sorry new computer. i have no money dude no shame with the 10 gift itself that's one of my favorite favorite hey, clips up, you know what this reminds me of? okay honestly my favorite miskiff stream ever that I actually was like there for was um when he was in New York with Maya embarrassing her like that was on another level I want to like go through and like break down what made that stream so good I thought of you dude that's my fucking Gatorade no it's not it's my fucking Gatorade there's a certain sort of vibe that like these kinds of these kinds of characters have when they're all together like this like it's so there's something so cozy about it. It's just missing now with all of like Miskiff's newer no, stuff. What are you doing? This is Miskiff's humor and it's always been like this and it's still like this today. Also, that McConnell shout out Twitch Prime. Same sluts that rejected us. I don't know why Same sluts. that I don't know why she reacted like that. Like, what was the point of that? Like, see how intense the music is? How, like, it's so... These kinds of intense moments don't seem like they happen nearly as often anymore. Like, it's... There's nothing playful. There's nothing, um... There's no, like... Like, the moments where he was, like, pretending to be Avatar Last Airbender. Or when he just puts on some random song and everyone just falls into the vibe and does this, like, IRL sort of, like, role play. And they all play off of each other. And just so nice in the way that they did it. And even though it was like, it was all jokes, there was like a hint of seriousness to it in that like, like this is real shit, you know? You saved me! Huh? 
Oh my god, you saved me. You're a hero. Actually got a big Okay. That's it. This is it right here. <laughs> this right here is the magic of Miskiff's content. This is what makes him so cool. And he probably doesn't even know what the fuck he just did. Like, okay, at first, okay, I have to explain this. It might seem like a mundane thing. It's not, it's like this clip right here is not even good enough to get like a chuckle, you know? But it's just like, this is, ultimately what this is, is it's a work of film. And I'm gonna get all, all film nerd right now, okay? But film isn't influential because it makes people react in a certain way immediately. It can do that, but that's not what it's, that's not its main strength. That's what music is for, okay? That's music's main strength. We're making you cry instantly. Music is influential because it influences the way people see life and like their worldviews and their values and their desires and like principles and all that shit. And it changes the way they act and the decisions they make years down the line. And there's subtext here that like, that I can explain kind of. And a lot of people, okay, okay. I'm about to go into a whole video essay right now. A lot of people don't like the new Mizkif. And I'm about to explain why. I'm about to speak on behalf of at least a few of these people. Because Mizkif was able to have moments like this. And what's more is he did it effortlessly without even thinking about it. He just did it just because he felt like it. And that's what makes it incredible. But you might be like, oh, so what? It's not even that great of a moment. You said it yourself. No, the the text, the, the on the surface level, it's not that great of a clip. But deep down, it's actually absolutely essential to his character so why like let's take the obvious first of all okay miz was never gonna fall in the water like his other hand is holding this like metal bar thing see that he did that intentionally so that he could like use the metal bar thing to pull himself back up if maya couldn't and like no doubt she helped him right but then he says these words listen oh, my God. listen listen you saved me you saved me. Think about that for a second. Really think about what he said. Like, do you notice anything archetypal here? It's a shame American media is so fucked now. Like, if you want strong examples of the playful goddess archetype, you have to go to Japanese media. I'm glad I found this. Like, okay, take for example, um, uh, okay, Mishoku Tensei, right? What's that girl's name? The super powerful one, like the demon princess or whatever, Kishirika or something. Maybe I shouldn't hit images on the ah, screw it, whatever. Look, that's the eye. This is the this is also the problem with Japanese media. For every for every um great thing they have going for them, there's also like a major drawback that's always holding it back. And and she says the same thing. Look at this, look at this. You saved my life, just like how Miss Kip said. You saved me. Isn't that interesting? And there's a reason why I'm drawing this comparison right here. When it comes to... Here, just watch, watch. Like, notice notice the behavior and the, and the music going on right here. She's overpowered as fuck, okay? She has like 13 different demon eyes. And even one of those eyes is enough to make someone basically a god, all right? Like... The eye of foresight lets you see into the future. Like that one eye alone is, it makes you OP beyond anybody else in that world. And then she has that other eye that lets her like see anybody else, no matter where they are, like at any given moment, their exact location. And that's just two. She has so many more. So like, why the hell was she asking for a favor? Like why with all of that power was she so helpless that she was asking for money or some like food just to survive as if she was a beggar. Like when Rudy gave her that like random street food or whatever, and she goes like, oh, this is the best food ever, thank you. If you hadn't come along, I would have died. You're solely responsible for me surviving the next few hundred years. And they like move on from it quickly because Rudy interprets it, ter interprets it as a joke, which it, it is. But there's like a subtle message that like slips in there that like, enters your head and just makes a nest in there that you don't really realize when you're watching it. She is far beyond the capabilities of anybody else seen in the show so far. Even in like the entire first season actually, even after this. Like she did not need Rudy and Rudy did not, definitely did not just save her. So like, what the hell is the reason for this? What is the reason for like, for saying, 
you saved my life. Like, why do that? Just to be playful? Like, let's really, really break it down here. What is her incentive to make it seem like Rudy just did her a giant favor? Like a, like a life-changing like favor that she must repay the debt for. Is she just that powerful that she's totally okay with owing other people favors like that? Like major life-changing favors? Or like, okay, remember in um, Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild? So you find the Great Fairy Fountain. Oh, he didn't get the fairy. Ah, oh. so this is super interesting, okay? This, this is the Great Fairy. This is like the flower bud or whatever that she's in. I didn't even notice the spikes in I just now realized that. God damn. It's so this this whole world I want to play Zelda of Breath of the Wild actually. I wanna play that next. But um and this is another piece of Japanese media, by the way. So you go to the fountain and a literal goddess pops out of this plant like the bud here. And like you talk to her and she first says, like, oh I'm I'm trapped in here, you need to release me. Please give me one hundred rupees so I can break free from this like magical bond. Like think about that for a second. Why the hell would you need rupees to do something magical? And like, what's more is how assertive she is about it. Like, she literally opens up a part of the flower to stick out her hand and take your rupees. And if she can do that, can't she just escape already? Like, these things are left ambiguous for a reason. Or why don't she, why doesn't she just bloom the flower with her divine powers? You know, if she can already do that. What does she need the rupees for? And you know what else? The next time you see her, she asks for 300 rupees. Like, dog, she's toying with us. She's trolling. That's what she's doing. She's just having fun. She doesn't need the rupees. If you, like, here, let me, let me play it. I'm nearly powerless. I beg your help. I need rupees to become whole again. Like, dude, wish she can just open it anyways. Hand them over to me quickly. She clearly doesn't have much patience, right? She's been waiting there for so long. You ain't... And look how she takes it. Every, listen, this game was so expensive to make, every single little animation was done intentionally. They would not do this like playful little like snatch if they didn't have a reason for it. God, it's crazy. It's crazy the way they made it. To the people out there who have consumed enough Japanese media, you'll have seen this archetype out there. I call it the playful goddess archetype because it's usually, well not usually, but when when it stands out, it's usually a, like a female or like a mother figure or like an older sister figure. That's just when, it, when you really, really notice it. And the usual representation of this sort of thing just coincides really well with mother nature. And honestly, this archetype isn't even real. It's just like, I watch enough anime to separate out mother nature and playful goddess as two different things. Even though like 95% of the time they end up being the same characters. Like Palutena, for example, I'm gonna just, I really liked how she looked in Brawl. Like, dude, come on. That's so good, that's so good. So notice all these things that I'm showing right now. This is all, except for this, but okay. Th I, this is all for preface. But this is the playful goddess archetype. This sort of behavior exists in men as well. In fact, I think it's actually much more common with like males in real life than females. This sort of like philanthropic attitude. But when females do it, it's sort of like a like a one of the boys moments type thing. And that's when you can really study this sort of thing. That's the playful goddess archetype. Listen, if I were to make an archetype, it would just be a strong stoic man all right that's ultimately like an altruistic man that, that's what it would be but it doesn't necessarily stand out because it's pretty common and it's actually a pretty shallow trait compared to the kind of traits that you typically give in your male main characters it's a very uncommon trait however for females and it typically only comes with great maturity i don't know if you know this or not but people are reluctant to make females mature in media they kind of want them to be as young as possible, but that's a topic for a different day. And this sort of like, being this like strong independent woman who needs no man, like that doesn't make you virtuous, you know? But being so strong and independent that you need other people so that you can assist them, so you can be a part of their lives and let them join in on the fun because of how much fun you're having and you can give them a piece of that part of your life. That's what makes you virtuous. And this kind of like, power and virtue when it's achieved by females 
or just feminine people in general in in real life it manifests in this archetype and when they help so many people like this and they get really relaxed in their approach and they start to do it playfully and not get all preachy like that's when the magic comes into play that's when you know that they're like a really really special per special kind of person and like a lot of people have these traits actually it's not like super rare but most of the time they don't do it enough to where they're like super preachy about it and like if you're into politics for example you're already kind of disqualified from this entirely which is part of the reason why i think possibly i don't know that but like i think maybe maya played a role in snuffing this attitude out of Mizkif. but like even me like i'm super preachy like look at what i'm doing right now i try to be like that guy you know like this guy like the guy who will owe you a favor the guy who will like be there for you if you need me or when you need me, actually. If I easily make it so that someone can do something for me, I'm very calculated about it. If I can make it so that somebody does me a favor so I can owe them a favor, that they can cash in at any, at any moment, I feel good about that. That makes me feel good when I can go into debt to people and it costs them nearly nothing, but they can get a lot out of it. If I can help people, that makes me feel good like that. I feel all warm and fuzzy inside. And I tell people, like, they can rely on me, you know? I'm really authentic about it. And because of that, I'm not, I don't do it as much as I would like to. It's a kind of a rare occurrence for me. I'm not in such a great position in my life where I can just go around treating this like, like my time and effort in, in this really philanthropic way. Like a, I can't treat it like a game, you know? It isn't all that fun for me just yet because it, it's really taxing for me. But I tell people, I still tell people because I want to be that guy. I tell them like, I am that guy. Like I'm the guy that's going to be in your corner when nobody else will. You know, I'll have your back when nobody else will. Even when you're down, actually, especially when you're down. Like I've had situations where people abandon me and I could never do that to somebody else. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not the friend that you want to party with or like celebrate with. Hey, Afraz, I got all this like stuff that like I, I accomplished so much. Okay, good for you. I don't care about being there for you in your best moments. You don't need me there in your best moments. Uh, like to save your own time, to save your own effort, do what you got to do, you know? Use me, like take advantage of me, you know? That's what I enjoy. I enjoy when people use me to better their own lives and they get something out of it. If you don't need me for something, if you don't like need me for a favor or something like that, don't even bother you could save your breath. You don't need to give me any gifts. You don't need to spare your sympathy for me. None of that. I don't need it. I, I get my happiness. I cope with life and all that stuff from being the friend that's going to be there for you, not in your best moments, but in your worst moments. And this goes for anyone in my life. If you're, you're hearing this, like if you're ever down, if you're at a low point, you hit me up, you go, yo, Frost, I got this shit going on. My life is like this. And like, I'll tell you, like, cut the bullshit. Tell me straight up, Afraz, what can you do for me? Can we link up? Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Can you lend me this? Or can you introduce me to this person that you know? Like, that's what I like to hear. But I'm not really at a stage in my life where I can treat it like a game. I still get really preachy about it. It isn't where it's like a... Like how he can just make it a joke how it's so effortless for him. Unlike Miskiff, I'm actually not doing so great right now. Like having a roof over my head hasn't actually been the easiest thing for me lately. But one day I hope to reach that level. Like, I, I admire that. Like really, like what Miskif said and, and what uh, Kushirika or Kishirika and what the great fairy said is basically they're, they're implying, their subtext here, they're implying like, I got your back, you know? But they said it in such a playful way. Like it's obvious they've been doing it for so long. They just want to have fun. They don't want to get all preachy about it. And like you think about it for one second. Why did the great fairy ask for those rupees? Why was she also like, like this immensely powerful being acting so grateful that you just freed her? And like this demon girl, the great fairy and this demon girl both do favors for you. The great fairy enchants your clothing and also has all this like flora and fauna. You can collect the fairies. You can come back to life. There's like hella mighty thistles and truffles and all that shit. It's like the loot is top tier every time. And it's just available for you to take. And I'm not really speaking in a structured way. It's, it's late. I'm tired. Ugh, let me explain this right. Okay. I'm going to start. I'm going to structure this right. Okay. This archetype means something. It means that this person is so powerful, so competent and benevolent that they'll ask for some favor, like a small favor that really means nothing. And then they'll say it was a big deal, even when it wasn't, just to make you feel good. 
and to make you feel like you can trust them, like you're you're secure around them, you know, you can let your guard down. And it almost makes you feel like you broke the ice on your own accord, even though they did all the work. Now, because you did them a favor, they got your back and they owe you a favor. Now, if you do this and you try to make it seem natural, but you're doing it based off of like an education, like what I'm telling you right now, and you're actually a really calculated storyteller like me, and you're just trying to be the main character of life, girls tend to pick up on that shit. Like they have an eye for that sort of thing. Guys don't, but girls tend to, unless they're on birth control, then they don't have an eye for shit. But naturally, girls can sense this kind of bullshit. At least when they're like, you can basically guarantee that if she's 18 years or older, she will be able to tell, like she will be able to scope out your bullshit and be able to tell if you're doing this, if you're acting like this because you actually enjoy the playfulness of it, or if you're acting like it because you just want her to like you. But if you treat it like a joke, like you make it so obvious and outlandish, like the way that the the demon girl was saying, um, oh, this one meal is gonna keep letting me live after almost perishing after like 300 years or some shit, you know? And, and the animators of the great fairy just putting her hand out and just snatching the rupees off of you to give her this like sense of greed. Even though you can tell, there isn't an ounce of greed in her. The reason why they did that was to make her seem more relatable. And Nintendo, this is understandable. And this, huh, I guess it is Nintendo. You look at what these two had going on right here. Nintendo literally, they have writers who can actually write good. They have marketers who know how to do more than just Facebook ads. And they have psychologists who aren't all just Democrats. So they literally have the best minds in the world working on their stories. So they know everything I'm saying here. They, they know all this. They're able to actually carefully craft these stories that I can only analyze. I can never make something like this. I can only analyze them. And Mushoku Tensei is the godfather of isekai as a genre. Like, I expect nothing less, right? These, these things all come with very, very high expectations. But Mizkif, he did the same thing with perfect timing in an even more efficient way than all three of these without even knowing the psychological or storytelling implications behind it. And he did it just to play, just because he felt like it. He's literally... You think about it, we're, in reality, we're all losers. Everybody who watches Twitch and streams on Twitch as well, we're all just a bunch of losers is all we are. And if you're the best, the best streamer and you're like the coolest among us, you're just the, a winner among losers. That's all you are. And let's not kid ourselves. Like, let's not try to pretend like we're anything different than this. We're all watching Twitch because we don't have all this other great stuff to do with our time. We're spending our t hours on Twitch because we kind of suck at making friends in the real world and things like that. We kind of don't have that much stuff going on in our lives. And the way Mizkif was doing stuff like this, he's literally teaching Twitch viewers how to be social and how to make friends. Like this is peak education, peak content when you really, really think about it. You watch the clip in a vacuum and you might not think there's anything special about it, but this is actually peak content. And like, okay, imagine you're the great fairy, okay? For example, the great fairy. I think the great fairy is the best example of this. For all intents and purposes, you have no limits to your power, okay? You can basically literally control the outcome of anything. Like, you could stop Ganon if you felt like it. You're, you're omnipotent, okay? Hypothetically, let's say, imagine yourself in this situation. Now, if you weren't so smart, if you had godlike powers and you weren't so smart, if you were like the people in politics today, you would probably try to make the world a safer place and probably try to make people happier, right? And you would eventually reach this level of prosperity where nothing is painful to anyone. Nothing harmful ever happens. Everybody just has everything they need. You can basically rework the odds of the universe to, to establish world peace, you know? And eventually you would just get so bored of a world without any sort of conflict or challenge that you would intentionally start causing bad things to happen, like natural disasters and shit, just to work against that and to have a bit of fun. And boom, you're a supervillain just like that. You're the bad guy. And that's what happens when these powerful people, yet stupid people, enter positions of power. It's what happens when these very, very non-masculine men in particular become powerful politicians and they think with very small minds and they assume that the right course of action is to make the world a quote unquote better place as if they know what better means for everyone else other than them. Power and competence and, and strength and skill isn't enough. 
It takes a smart person to realize that power is needed to change the world, but it takes a wise person to realize maybe changing the world isn't this like oh so great axiom that we all thought it was. Maybe the world is as it should be. Maybe the world should be this flawed and, and painful and scary and murderous and and I'm not pulling my punches like maybe it should be this unfair and unjust place like RNG suffering maybe that is what it should be and so the wise people the really truly wise people they let go and they don't use their full power level they restrain themselves if they have that power intentionally they don't care so much about defending the world or defending themselves it was never explained how the great fairy got trapped and it honestly doesn't even matter and or like when the when uh, the demon girl was tied up She's OP, dude. She's obviously powerful enough to get out of this situation, right? And she got kidnapped. So, <laughs> it's so stupid. So Roxy buys her to make sure she doesn't get sold off. That's the thing. She ain't joking. There's there's something so interesting about like the playful attitude that she has. What's more important here is that when she leaves, Kishirika doesn't even bother to like tell her like, hey, can you take the ropes off me? She doesn't care. She's so uninterested in her own safety, like her own protection. And like, why would she? All she did was ask Roxy if she wanted a demon eye in return for saving her, which is a thing that she could have already done. There's no, she didn't show an ounce of a concern for her own safety at all. And she's powerful enough to get out of the ropes whenever she wants. So like, who even cares, you know? You need to, if you want to reach this archetype, you need to be powerful enough that you can let others around you know that you can have their backs and you can protect yourself and they can rely on you even if they don't have your back and you can't rely on them. The message you're portraying is no need to worry. You're capable enough for the both of you. But like the power itself isn't enough. You need altruism. You need wisdom. You need like the 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 wisdom to see that in a world of people not as strong as you, the only right move is to restrain yourself and to, to be playful about it. Just to keep it fair, basically. But actually that goes into a different topic. I don't want to talk about that right now. But you shouldn't try to change others. You should accept the world for what it is and live with it. Which is why the weak people generally want others to change for them. They want others to um, say certain things. They want others to call them by certain names, or pronouns or whatever. They want others to restrict their speech that they say. Oh, you can't say this. You can't say that. Oh, you can't make these jokes. You... These are all the weak people of the world. The strong people of the world don't care what anybody else says. If you're truly, if you truly have strength and, and competence, you accept the world for what it is and you deal with it. If you want to accept the world for what it is, you need to like it. You need to have fun. You need to be able to have a sense of humor enough to make it blatantly obvious that you did not need their help, but you'll owe them a favor anyways, because you're just so powerful that you can grant them these life-changing favors, even if they don't do anything for you, like in reality, like comparatively. And these complex social interactions that exist among humans today can be broken down and explained the way I did just now. Well, I can do it to a certain extent, not like that much. But our brains are just so big and so optimized to handle social calculation that people can understand what Miskiff is doing and internally, without really realizing it, we take that into account and we all know what that means deep down. Like, think about it for a second, okay? You, breaking it down into words is a different thing and that doesn't take very much intelligence. That just takes analysis. But after watching this, doesn't... Like this right here. Oh my god, you saved me. You're a hero. Doesn't this like break the ice a little bit? Like doesn't it make you feel 
somewhat of a sense of trust in Miss Kiff. Like, doesn't it make you smile a little bit? Like, hey, bro, you know what? You're cool. Let me keep walking with you. Isn't it like a little, just a little bit less awkward now? Just a little bit more playful. The atmosphere is a little nicer. You you already understand exactly what this means because humans as social creatures, like we're all smart enough to trust Mizkif after he does shit like this, or maybe trust him a little bit more. But like, why do you trust him more? And most people can't explain why. I I can, I can. I'm, I'm about to brag, I'm about to flex so hard. And it's this archetype. It's the playful goddess archetype. He embodied the archetype. It implies someone who is like beneficent and merciful. And I got that from the Duha. But it implies that they respect you and that they understand you. And not only that, they understand themselves and they understand the, the social dynamic between both of you to like a complete extent to where they can like take these risks because they know the consequences of the risks. They know how the outcomes will go based on whatever they say. They know the strategies. They know the flow chart of it all. And it also means, it also means they're patient. These kinds of things where you find the metal bar or whatever, you sort of just wait for them to come around. You don't actively go out seeking moments to show your altruism you have to be patient for this sort of thing otherwise there's no fun to it and you don't do it because you're calculated and cunning and and you make an attempt to do it just off of a a storytelling intention the way i do i'm not that doesn't it's not actually a really good intention to be honest it makes me regret the way i treat people whenever i do this sort of thing but you do it because it's fun and that really is the best reason to do things and you have to be patient, which is probably the most difficult thing when having this archetype. And it's the thing that Miskif lacks so much now, especially. Like the patience in Miskif's life is nearly all gone from what it seems like. And uh, look at the other like great people here. How many years do you think, actually how many centuries was the great fairy just hanging around underground? At least one century, right? Considering how, Link, how long Link was asleep. If someone is strong, they'll be, they'll be mad at other people for not being at their level, right? But if someone is really strong, they'll be patient enough to meet someone worth spending mental energy on. Kishirika, how many times must she have sat down in alleys and dealt with like people selling her off to, to slave owners and all this stuff? How many times have, have she must have dealt with like the most toxic, like garbage people? before she finally found someone who's just willing to do like a little bit of role play. That's really all she wanted. Think about it from like the great fairy perspective. She could have been this like bitter, resentful. She could have she could have easily told Link like, you've been asleep for a hundred years. Nobody was here to set me free. No, she has the patience and wisdom to know that she's going to outlast these people. And in the grand scheme of her own life, these people are only here for a fraction of, of the time. And so during the limited time that she has to, to be playful around the people that she truly respects and can actually like interact with on the same level, she wants to spend every single second of it smiling and laughing. Like being resentful and bitter is simply a waste of her time. Like she didn't actually care that you freed her like on a, on a, on a grander level, you know? She didn't actually care. She cared on a social level. Like they even show in the cutscene, like they make a point of showing you that she doesn't even care about being on the surface. Like when the flower is bloomed and and like the, um she's done blowing fairy dust on you, she just goes back underwater. Like look, oh yeah, and she makes that whole she makes all the armor sets OP. Like she just she just leaves. Doesn't even care about being above the water. Like what's even the point of being freed? She's only there when you want a favor. That's the only time she ever comes out. And this sort of behavior it implies a lot, but mostly it implies good intentions with no ulterior motive. And I make an attempt to do this sort of thing. Like I, I occasionally find ways for people to, oh, help me out in this dire situation by like buying me wings when I forget my wallet. You know, this like, oh, can I can I borrow $10 to buy these wings? Or like, we're all, we'll all be at a restaurant. I, we all get groceries or whatever. And I can't pitch in because I don't have the money. Or like, oh, can you can you give me a ride? I gotta be somewhere. And it's only like five minutes away. I could have just Ubered there. And I always make sure to repay my debt. Like I have a note sheet that has all my debt and I make sure to give them like a 10,000 X return in value. Like not in like money value, but just in general value, you know? And I'm not able to do this just yet at the scale that I want to. It's a rare occurrence for me. I'd love, love, love to do it more. And best believe I plan on it. Like I, I intend to, I like this. 
if you're really with the shit, you don't mind going into some social debt to some people just to keep life interesting. You know, just for the challenge, just for fun. How the hell could you have an ulterior motive if this is how you behave with people? You're only benefiting the other person. Like, you're getting nothing from them. You're asking for nothing. You're expecting nothing from anybody else. You're only benefiting other people. There is no ulterior motive you could have. And I can, in a calculated way, do these things because... I'm, I'm just gonna flex real quick. I've been making these videos since I was like seven years old and I've studied storytelling side by side with psychology for almost my entire life. So I can break down these social interactions and use them for myself. But Ms. Kiff? God Look at this. Me. You're a hero. Actually got a Look at the up. birds. Please. Miss Kiff is not as book smart as me, but he did it anyways. And you know what? He did something I can't do. He did this naturally on his own. It didn't even take him a second to think about it. He saw the bar and he's like, oh, opportunity strikes. And in his mind, all he's doing is just having a bit of fun. He probably doesn't even know what he did. He probably doesn't even know a single word of what I just said. And a psychologist would look at that and be like, damn, you're a good guy, Matt, you know? And like me, I can confidently say that. Ms. Kiff is a good guy. The fact that he gets enjoyment from being generous with no ulterior motive, like I can confidently tell you Ms. Kiff is a good person, like a genuinely deep down good person. At least I believe so. And this all circles right back around to why we miss the old Ms. Kiff, because he was able to pull off moments like this that would really show you like the depth, the, the absolute depth of his character. There's no depth, everything is so surface level now. Like, he tries so hard. Like, it's, and you shouldn't try to be cool, okay? He should just be cool, not try. He should try to be whoever he is. And if he sees himself as lacking in certain aspects, instead of trying to change that for the camera, he should just change that in his life and just make the camera as a, 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 a attribute to the most authentic life you can ever live, rather than changing the way you act on and off camera. I don't know for sure. I don't know him but it seems more and more inauthentic. Like he doesn't do shit on the spot like this anymore. Not like not like how he used to, not so much, you know? But I, he's always done just whatever he seems is like the most fun, you know? And back then it was like next level storytelling, like teaching people how to be social, teaching people how to talk to girls. It's like really cultivating a higher level of viewers, of, of an audience, bringing the audience in to a totally different level than has ever been done before, creating totally different kinds of impressions, you know, really changing the game. And now whatever he chooses to do on the spot, the, the on the spot stuff he has, where, where he's quick on his feet nowadays, all he does is like the same jokes over and over and over again, or like saying something super ironic for no reason. And it becomes predictable. And it's like, even after all that, he doesn't even do anything anymore. Like everything that, that all the clips of Miskiff is just him saying things. There's never actions, like what's going on in these clips. He doesn't do stuff. He just says stuff now. Actually, it's not even saying stuff. It's always just reactions to what other people do now. He always has all these girls on his stream. And like, man, Miskiff became such a pussy after dating Maya. But hey, like nobody, nobody's perfect. The old, the old Miskiff isn't sustainable. He was a god tier streamer in a league of his own. But like that kind of person can't last forever. People grow up. And is Maya responsible for changing him? I don't know. I doubt it, to be honest. Like I doubt she was the main factor. I think it happened mainly after his view count rose. I don't, really out of no fault of his own. I just don't think he, he was ever really built for such a thing. It's nearly impossible at that level to start to see your community as all very close friends, a very close, tight community. In his eyes, his community probably turned into something else. It probably probably went from friends to being fans. I'm just speculating right now, but it, like, back in, like, the older shit, like, like, this right here literally feels like you could just pull up to his house and just hang out with him. Like there's, I feel like I could just show up to his house and just like kick it with him, you know? There's something so down to earth about this like webcam quality, this frame rate with like the bed in the back. And there's like this collection of stuff right here on this wall that this is like stuff that I could see myself owning, you know? Not like 
You, have you seen his new collection? These fucking boxes that like cost more than my car. Like the, the the whole collection of boxes probably cost more than like my house. So it's for lack of a better word, it's relatable. As a viewer, I think to myself like, hey, if this guy can do it, so can I. And the viewers, like the OG viewers, the viewers that he alienated, I believe, probably thought the same way. It made people feel good. It was like, it felt like we could have been homies. It felt like if I hop in his chat, I would just default already treat him like a friend. Like we already knew each other for so long, even though we didn't. And there's a conversation to be had there about how that may not actually be the most healthy way to look at things. I don't think we're at that stage yet where that's a conversation that can really be had at a at a real technical level where people can debate about that, where the internet is still in its infancy. We still don't understand the implications of all this stuff, but I'm just saying how I felt, really. It felt like like Russell and E-Rob and, and all the other dudes and like Lakari and uh, dang, where's Darion? I thought Darion was in this clip, but it, it really just felt like all these guys were just people who just watch each other on Twitch, just like fans of each other. And they were just breaking the boundary and just becoming friends. And that sort of like breaking boundaries style of making content that like dissolving the barrier between fan and friend. Like, first of all, there's already this, this huge barrier between viewer and creator because not every viewer is a creator. And not every creator is also like a viewer of the content. Like, like you look at the people who run things, like Susan Wojcicki doesn't know how to upload a YouTube video. I don't think Jimmy Fallon even knows his YouTube channel even exists. A lot of creators are not in touch with their viewers at all. And a lot of viewers are not creators. They're not active community members, you know, but Twitch is a bit different. And especially with the audience that Mizkif cultivated, like when he was doing stuff like this. And he doesn't, I feel like he doesn't have anything close to this sort of aesthetic today. It's not at all like what he used to have. Like back when he was doing more original shit. Like I remember when I stopped watching him actually. This was like one of the last, this was the second to last video I ever saw. Third, second to last or third to last video I ever saw from Mizkif. Like full length YouTube video. And it was when, um... Do you guys remember on Twitch a couple years ago when like that e-girl website popped up where you can like pay to like play video games with e-girls on some like dystopian setup? Like that was insane. I can't even believe that was a real thing. Real smart actually. But that website came up real quick and it died off real quick. But yeah, they, they, they found this e-girl on this website and then they like set up this like date with her and Slick. Like a real life date with an e-girl. And like, meanwhile, everybody else is making videos on this website and nobody's doing anything like that. And then these guys, Mizkif back then, was like an a underground trendsetter. He was one of these guys who, despite the small size of his viewers, the quality of his viewers eclipsed every other streamer. Because like two days later, fucking Tifu hits up the same girl that was on Miz's stream, unknown girl. Mizkif was the first person who talked to her on that e-girl site. Tifu gets like 10 times the number of viewers on that stream and he doesn't do anything nearly as funny or creative. He doesn't fly her out or anything. I think even they even live in the same state actually. May, uh, actually, no, maybe not. But all he does is just like play a few games of Fortnite with her. Like what? How uncreative. And nowadays, Mizkif seems more like the Tifu in that situation than the old Mizkif. Like all he does now is lightly parody other streamers, heavily parody himself, make self-aware jokes that really aren't actually self-aware, have hot girls on stream, and wait for other people to do shit so that way he can react by going like, oh my god, and then he can like start fake laughing. You ever notice how whenever he laughs, he always looks away from the camera, like he he runs away or he like throws his head back or he like bends his whole torso over and like he puts his hands in his face. Like he knows that people will pick up on his fake laughter. So he hides it. All he does now is reactions. And everyone calls everyone like a react Andy. Like all these streamers are called react Andys, right? But now, back then I couldn't even imagine anyone calling him one other than for a joke. But now Mizkif actually is one. And the reason why nobody picks up on it is because he reacts to IRL stuff rather than videos. So nobody ever accuses him of being a react Andy, but it's just the same. It's all the same. Like all those, all, and all those like events, like the, um, like the skits, like the higher level production, like shows and stuff. That isn't even Mizkif, that's OTK that's doing all that. And yeah, you can say like, okay, OTK, well, that's Mizkif. He's like the center of it basically. But then you actually reach a different problem. And that's like, his content has become so detached. Like there's nothing relatable about it anymore. 
Like, there's nothing like, I don't feel like I could have been in Miskiff's shoes. Like, back when he was doing all this other shit, like, I felt like if I was in Miskiff's shoes, I would be doing the same thing. And it would be just as fun. And I get to live vicariously through him. There's nothing relatable about that anymore. Damn. I don't want to get, I don't want to get upset about it. Because it's not even that serious. But I just get preachy about stuff like this. Whenever he does this, like, newer, detached sort of content... Like, whenever he does it on his own, it comes across as detached. And whenever he does it as, like, this OTK thing, it's always just S-Fan being the leader of that every time, you know? And S-Fan has a different um, appeal. Very similar to what I'm saying right now, but a, a different appeal altogether. I'll talk about that a different day, probably. And look, I don't know his situation. I don't know the guy. But you would think that when someone gets more money and more followers and more viewers and more, like, financial security, that they would start to go, like, you know what? I have financial freedom now. At least a bit more of it. Now I can actually, like, start to have some fun. You know, I can start to take some more risks. But nope. I see it happen over and over and over again. Like, the people who would okay but nah that's not even fair for me to say i don't even have money like that it's it's kind of a hypocritical thing for me to say that's probably why i don't have money like that because i don't look at the same ways all these other people where you take risks when you don't have much money and you reduce risk when you have a lot i kind of look at it the other way around but that's just me but this this playful goddess archetype that he would occasionally show like implying basically how easygoing he was making the audience feel like like if they met him in person, they could just dap him up and like making making it feel like I would have been homies with him if I just walked up to him when, when he's like outdoors somewhere, hanging out with his friends. I could just like pull up to him like, hey, yo, what's up, Miz? That feeling that I got when watching his streams, he doesn't have that anymore. It's just gone. That magic is gone. And this is just one thing. And it's kind of a small thing. But like his whole trip to New York actually showed so much more. That one had main character energy in a world of NPCs. Or like, um, all the, even the older streams, older than this, where you would just be in a super dark, super dark room, just like, hella, like, grainy, noisy. You would just be like, staring at a wall for like, five hours or something. Actually, no, that was, that was after this, I believe. But, man, all of these things together, there's like, 25 or so, like, incredible attributes that I can elaborate on, that are all gone now. And this playful goddess archetype is literally just one. And it's actually super interesting. I wish I could like, I wish I could like link you guys to a website with like a bunch of examples of this archetype, playful goddess. The only problem is I came up with it myself and I don't keep track of what I watch. I know there's a ton of examples. I just can't think of them off the top. Fujiwara Chika is a good example actually. That shows elements of it. Like when she teaches Shirogane, actually that that leans more towards the mother nature, that, that leans more actually towards the, the force of nature side of things, but more on a comic relief side, because she's not like an expert in any of these things, so it's not like she's really with the shit like that, she could just do basic skills. I wish I cataloged this sort of thing, that's my problem though, because I'm not organized. It's crazy, me not being organized means that the research on this entire field isn't organized. That's the problem when you have a unique skill set and, and perspective on stuff like this. Like, nobody else I know has the same level of expertise in storytelling, psychology, content creation, marketing, and the link between all four at the same time. I'm like the foremost expert in the field, which is cool because I'm kind of like leading the charge on updating the meta. But it also sucks because I can never like look anything up that I don't know. Like it's a struggle that I never thought I would have. Like if I don't know something in this field, nobody else knows it either. I can't just look it up on Google the way you, you, I, I would just look up like a historical fact or something. And yeah, I'm, I am bragging, but this isn't actually all that much to brag about, believe it or not. That's why I'm trying so hard to brag. So I'm really milking it for what it has. I mean, like, you look at how smart these other storytellers are. I mean, look, we still learn about Greek mythology nowadays. And the Greeks didn't even come up with the playful goddess archetype, even though they're all about goddesses. They came up with, like, Athena and Hestia, who have similarities, but only in that they're, like, powerful and, like, benevolent and stuff. But there, there is probably more obscure examples that I don't know about. But ultimately, in this space... All you really need to be someone who changes the meta, all you really need to do is to tell fun stories. That's really it. Motherfucking Toby Fox is better than me at that shit. Like, he's out here, like, developing games, and I'm just streaming, talking about it. Oh, shit, Persephone. Totally forgot. Yeah, no, I think that's actually it. Oh, that's close. Not exactly, but yeah. Persephone has... Oh, shit. 
Nah, because no sexual intentions. That was one of the things that I came up with. But then again, it's like playfulness and fun and charming. Uh, but then there's also innocence. Actually, no, I think she is innocent. But then there's also this, which like, does this look like the most innocent person? So it's, it's, this is still up for grabs. Like this isn't even a real established archetype. Like I made it up. And so the Greeks probably got really close. There's probably some other examples too. They probably got really, really close to the same archetype as me and like the great fairy and all this stuff. And like the um, demon girl, Kashirka, whatever. Actually, I don't think they got, got close to the great fairy because the great fairy is more like a, like a mother, grandmother, aunt who comes to like visit and brings like the greatest foods you ever had in your entire life once a year or so and absolutely spoils you. Persephone, I think, is a bit too childish to fit the same archetype as the great fairy. Like the great fairy fits the archetype of like the aunt who only asks you for a hug in return for, she'd say some shit like, oh, if you want to pay me back for this Xbox I gave you, just give me a hug and we'll be even. And also Persephone is introverted too, I believe. And the playful goddess, introverted is not a is not a requirement, but like it's not a requirement to be extroverted for the playful goddess. But typically I would assume they would need to have at least one or two people around them at all times to have fun with them. At least I think so. I haven't actually done much research in particular on this archetype. Done quite a lot on some other ones, but not on this one in particular. I still don't know that much. I gotta find out more for myself. And also, I'm pretty sure that the playful goddess archetype is all, almost always single. And this applies to guys and girls. There's usually like a flirty undertone with some of the things that are said. I'm taking a lot of inspiration here from the great fairy. But she's either engaged like the demon girl, but like single in the way that she acts with you. Just like for the, for the banter and stuff. Or she's like the great fairy in that she's probably going to like outlive everyone else in the rest of the world. And that it really doesn't even make sense for any kind of romantic relationship with them. Or they're probably just single like Miz. But like what bothers me is that like nowadays, like you don't see stuff like this anymore. Nowadays, all Miz does is spend his time chasing clips. Like it's not about having the most entertaining streams anymore. Now it's about having the most entertaining YouTube videos. And even, even then, it's not even about that anymore. He's mindful of, of like, oh, if I react to this in a certain way, then we can cut the video right uh, right here and um, it'll cut me off and it'll make for a good TikTok. Like now it's it's gone from Twitch stream to YouTube video to TikTok. Like it's just getting worse or not worse, but it's it's completely abandoning the, the core audience and also like the whole self-aware humor. If you're self-aware that you're using hot girls like Emmy in your streams and in your thumbnails, that doesn't actually absolve you of any of the repercussions for, for doing so, you know? Just because you know you're being a clickbait YouTuber and you can make fun of yourself for being a clickbait YouTuber doesn't make you any less of one. Ta ah, fuck it, it ain't even that serious. I still like the new Miz. I don't watch his streams anymore, but like, he always shows up on my recommended page on YouTube, still. And it's always just clips. And half the time, the clips are scripted. And a big problem I find is, is that his fake laugh is starting to sound better and better, which really sucks. Like your fake laugh should sound fake. It should be an insult, actually. Like it should make things even more awkward. Like it should ruin like the, the whole vibe of the situation. But instead, if your fake laugh starts to sound too real, it destroys any of the trust that I have for you. And it makes me always have this lingering feeling like, oh, the moment he turns off the stream, he's probably gonna lose all that energy. Like none of this is authentic. But like back before he met Maya, back when he was doing stuff like this, like everything felt 100% real. Everything felt like the moment he turned off the camera, nothing would change. He would just keep going on exactly like it is in the stream. And on the real, this is a bit unrelated, but on the real, Miz needs to stop pretending like the, like the only reason he has all these girls on stream is for the views and for the money. Like he needs to stop pretending like, I'm actually not, I'm not gonna get into that, but he needs to stop acting like the, like the 19 layers of irony going to 20 layers of irony is just as funny as going from one layer of irony to two layers, you know? He needs to stop acting like the rem remainder of his streaming career is just gonna be this like rapid fire funny moments and it's not gonna be centered around some like major core memories. Because whether you like it or not, that is what's going to happen. Like he always acts like he cares less about the quality of his own life than his own viewers do. 
And he makes no attempt at all, I feel like, to hide when he's being inauthentic at this point. Like when, when someone's going through it and they act like everything is a-okay, it shows a serious lack of character development. Like people didn't like Miskiff because he was funny or because he was creative. Like those are all just along for the ride. They're just a bonus. They like him because of his character. They like him because he's likable. You don't just watch characters just to laugh. You watch them to laugh and to cry and to get scared and to be disgusted and to get angry and to smile and feel euphoria and all, like everything. And when you can experience all these emotions with someone, it creates a more robust and meaningful connection between the viewer and the creator. Like he can transcend that whole parasocial thing that people have going on nowadays, like that buzzword parasocial. He can come out on top of that. He has the potential to eclipse every other streamer on planet Earth and he doesn't do it. He's holding himself back. I don't even know if he's aware of that though, because like whenever I see what he's got going on right now, like he's got pretty good stuff. Like he's a master in the way that he speaks now and in the way that he can like just make anybody around him laugh so easily. Like, he's still got so many great attributes. In fact, he's probably got a ton of great attributes right now that he didn't have before. Like, if someone said they like the new Miskiff better than the old one, I couldn't blame them. It's not like Miskiff fell off. It's just the old Miz is gone. And there's a new Miz now. And sometimes I miss the old Miz. Like, those kinds of creators, I feel like, come around once every five years or so. In fact, I'd love to collaborate with Miz one day. Yeah, I just wish I started doing all this sooner because... I think I missed out on collaborating with that creator that once was, you know, and isn't anymore. Oh well, it's not even that serious, honestly. Collaborating with him today would still be great. He still does a really good job of making his viewers achieve that suspension of disbelief, even if it isn't always authentic. He does a better job than me, but that's because all my education is from film and, and movies. It's like all scripted and edited. From the way I look at things, suspension of disbelief is, is, is like a spectrum. And... Miz is able to do this intuitively. I don't think he ever got educated on this stuff. Actually, this is something I wanted to talk about. Suspension of dis disbelief being a spectrum, which is not something I hear other film YouTubers talk about all that much. The only way a film works is if the monkey part of your brain doesn't think it's a movie, if it thinks it's real. I'm going off on a tangent, screw it. But the monkey part of your brain, meaning everything from like your amygdala to your thalamus, all right? It all needs to believe that it's real, at least that much. And like the thalamus, yeah, no problem. Um, ape C girl with features that imply fertility, neuron activation acquired, okay? So like having hot girls on your stream is the most effortless way of, of achieving that, of getting the brain on board. And What's crazy is like back when he was smaller, it felt like he got these girls on his stream because of his charisma and because of the way that he talked. But now it feels like every girl that shows up on his stream just does so because of his clout. In fact, it doesn't even just feel like that. I'm almost guaranteeing that's what it is. And fooling the hypothalamus and stuff, the like deep stem part of the brain, it's effortless. Like lizard brain, it's effortless to fool that. You'd show a picture of food, it'll think it's real food. The real key, however, to bring people on board, to really bring them into the suspension of disbelief, is to fool the prefrontal cortex. Now, one, a person taking psychology might naturally assume that this is going to be a real challenge. I mean, like, the prefrontal cortex knows damn well that you're watching film, you know? It knows that you're sitting in a theater watching a projector screen or watching a stream on a computer. So how do you fool the prefrontal cortex? The short answer is you can't. The long answer is you don't have to like fool it in a literal sense. You can just convince it that what it's seeing is important, not real, important. The realism doesn't matter. And it could even be animated too while you're at it. You can even make it animate. But as long as the prefrontal cortex can be convinced that whatever you're watching should be taken from and learned from, whether or not it's real, then you can fool it and it'll be on board. And lucky for us, the prefrontal cortex is actually secretly a slave to the amygdala. So let's say you're someone easy to fool, right? Let's say you're like deep in politics, which people deep in politics are always easy to fool regardless of what side you're on. Like let's say you, listen, I have no, I have no preference, so I'm gonna go for low hanging fruit. I don't follow on any political side of the spectrum, so I'm just gonna like say this is a very hypothetical scenario. Let's say you hate Donald Trump, okay? All I gotta do to really bring your amygdala on board is I'll get you angry, 
which really works surprisingly well. So I'll have like some Donald Trump resembling villain in a movie. And I'll give you a nice little dose of confirmation bias, you know? I'll make him unnecessarily evil for no reason, just the way you perceive Donald Trump. Now, whether you like him or not, I'm just saying this all this hypothetically. I'll make him have all the attributes that just, like, get your blood boiling. And then, finally, I'll have the main character, like, some fucking, I don't know, Wonder Woman or something, like, come and kill them, right? Because she's a woman or something. I don't know. And by doing so, I'll end up convincing the prefrontal cortex that like hey the lesson here is that like this isn't really something to be taken as real like it really happened but it would help you put together some of the puzzle pieces in your own head as to how to perceive the world and that's what i get people to think when um i make my own films and that's how you can you know make movies like zootopia make so much money and that's how movies like Captain Marvel even get funded in the first place. Like an easy trick to make money in film, you know, to get people angry like that. And sell out writers convincing greedy directors to give them money to sell a movie to a stupid audience. Even then, on this level of fooling your prefrontal cortex into understanding that the message or the theme of something that you're trying to say, even though it may be fake, that also falls on a spectrum. Like, there's bad ways of doing it. Like, the Star Wars sequels way, you know? And then there's good ways, like the Dark Knight way. And, okay, keep in mind, this is all just my opinion on stuff. But, like, remember that scene in the Dark Knight where the Joker goes like, Hey, this guy right here, he's the scumbag that screwed you all over and took all your money. I'm gonna kill a new person every hour unless someone comes and kills this guy. And do you remember what everyone was doing? Everyone was like chasing after him, shooting at him, trying to like run him over with a truck. And you think to yourself like, damn, that would totally happen. In this situation of civilized people, they would all turn into savages. Like that's so realistic. And you learn from it. As long as it's important, it doesn't matter how realistic it is. Or as long as it's perceived by your prefrontal cortex to be important. Now, look, whether or not that lesson is actually right or wrong doesn't really matter. I have no clue. I don't even go out like that. But in general, in general, personally at least, I think the lessons in The Dark Knight are generally more right than wrong, or just across Chris Nolan's career as a whole. Like, when they were on the boats in the same movie, and they were like, people on the um, boat were like, hey, they're prisoners, just kill them, just blow up their boat before they blow up ours. And I think people actually would act like that in that situation. Like, people already act like that from what I can see. But then again, I'm just one dude. The, the message itself that you try to convey is irrelevant. What matters is that it resonates with people. You could probably fool someone's prefrontal cortex. Actually, there's no way you can't fool someone's prefrontal cortex. If you couldn't fool someone's prefrontal cortex, then there wouldn't be people making video essays on like the morality of Breaking Bad. It's literally transcended our definitions of real and fake. Suspension of disbelief has just become belief. I wish I had someone to talk to about this stuff. But yeah, with, with Miskiff, see, the beautiful thing is that with streamers, they kind of have a, a shortcut to fooling the prefrontal cortex and bringing the viewers on board. And really, all that is, is just calling themselves a streamer. That's really all it is. You want to know why Twitch viewers are so much better than YouTube viewers, like, culture-wise? Because YouTube has this, like, reputation as of late of, like, pumping out the most, like, garbage, corporate, like, clout-chasing, talentless people. The, the fact that, like, fucking Gabby Hanna can, like, make it so big on YouTube, or the fact that, like, the Island Boy can be so popular or like how Steve will do it gets more viewers than CoffeeZilla. Like the YouTube community is dying. In reality, if the community truly did interact with everybody else in the community and there was a lot more conversation between people, nobody would even still be watching Steve will do it. The, the, the community aspect of YouTube is dying. YouTube is growing, but the community aspect is dying. Nobody ever talks to each other. Nobody ever makes video responses to each other. The comment system is broken. The dislike button on comments doesn't work. It's, it hasn't worked for a long time. Dislikes on videos are now gone. If everyone had a discussion, like a lot of discussion, then most of these like garbage YouTubers would have no viewers. But like, let's say for Steve will do it, for example, none of his fans actually bother to go out and watch other videos people make about him. But on Twitch, everyone speaks about everything that everyone else says all the time. Like, look at what goes on in Reddit. Like, there's no escaping this. It's a very, very active community. On YouTube, though, you're a YouTuber first and a streamer second. But on Twitch, you're just a streamer and nothing else. Like, it dissolves this barrier to entry, this like parasocial relationship. 
Not really, but most YouTube viewers have no relationship with their audience, let alone a parasocial one. It's 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 almost, no, it is superficial. It's not like it's almost, it is superficial. It feels more like bots than the actual bots on Twitch. Why don't these companies hire me to do consulting for them? Like I'm literally getting to the heart of the fucking matter here and like I get no compensation. God damn it, this sucks. I studied content creation so long and I make absolutely no money for it. But to be fair, I haven't really had any major big breakthroughs in a while. Bro, back when I was in school, when I was little, I used to be such a beast, dude. I was making contributions and breakthroughs left and right. Like, I'm not necessarily like a super smart person, but just like the amount of time that I had and all the stuff in my life that I pushed to the side to understand what I was interested in. Bro, I could have sounded like a genius at any moment. Oh, damn, I am tired. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sleep. I'll talk about this later. I will continue this. I'm going to have to watch this stream, but I will continue this. Okay, bye guys.